The Darwin Awards honor those who made a conscious, clueless decision that removed them from the gene pool. <laughs> so the macho man who performs acrobatics well, on, the, on the balcony railing on the 23rd story, we have the, uh, the show-off at a party who juggles hand grenades and accidentally pulls the pin. And we have adventurers who strap hot air balloons onto their lawn chairs and sail off to see the world. People such as these deserve our honor and our respect for their sacrifice to improve the next generation of the human species. <laughs> the Darwin Awards are true tales with three important attributes. The winner must remove him or herself from the gene pool <laughs> by self-selection in a spectacularly amazing fashion. Now this award is generally bestowed posthumously, but the rare <laughs> Darwin Award winner does remain among us to serve as a living reminder of the perils of choosing risky romantic partners like vacuum cleaners or hot apple pies. Speaking, oh, do I have a clicker? Click. Thank you. <laughs> Living Darwin Award winners, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement wins a, <laughs> wins a mass Darwin Award for their praiseworthy slogan, May We Live Long and Die Out, a toast to the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. So I thank you all for coming today. When I hand out Darwin Awards, I typically have a rather small crowd in the audience. I sometimes feel like I'm talking to myself. So this a nice, uh, it's nice to see all of your smiling faces. Now me, I'm Wendy Northcutt. I'm a research scientist who specializes in thanatology, the academic study of death. Uh, there are three things I'd like you to know about me. First, I'm obsessed with hula hoops. I hula hoop every day. I make hula hoops. I'm sorry, but the slides are slightly unusual. Okay, I make hula hoops, I hula hoop, um, I sell them, I teach classes, and I even set hula hoops on fire and I spin burning white gas around my body. One of the reasons I became interested in the Darwin Awards is because I suspect I'm a likely victim. <laughs> Another thing I'd like to tell you about myself is that I am a mutant, like many of you here today. I was born with no muscles to open my eyes. It's a miracle that I can see it all. This illustrates a true story when I broke my ankle in my house by walking across a hole in the floor. So I'm on the run from the Bureau of Mutant Affairs. I'd like to request, please, no photography and no video of me. And third, I've become involved in a series of public service announcements uh, in the spirit of the Darwin Awards. And I'd like to play you one of those announcements now. Hey boys, this message is brought to you by the Darwin Awards condoms. Do your part. Be a population control volunteer. Remember, friends don't let friends reproduce. <laughs> Let's just leave it there for now. Okay, so I, I was working in a neurobiological research lab doing all kinds of crazy things like mutating DNA and infecting bacteria with, uh, with viruses. And the Darwin Awards at that time uh, were just a humor relief, a comic relief. As I'm driving down the road and those dumb drivers who always get in my way, it was just fun to think, well, I don't have to worry. Natural selection will take care of those who don't take care of themselves. So it started as college humor, but after a while, I started seeing some very interesting trends and patterns. Although I've been writing Darwin Awards since 1993, I did not invent the phrase. When I started, there were five Darwin Awards on the internet. And uh, um, I, I tried to follow the forwarded emails back to their source, but I never could. Um, I actually have a half-baked notion that the, Dar that the internet is actually sentient and the Darwin Awards were its, its first attempt at humor. <laughs> Today I want to show you evidence that Darwin Award winners are inextricably tied to human evolution, that, they are, uh, that he is the canary in the coal mine that shows the effect that we have had on ourselves by creating and imagining the world that we live in today. I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's very upsetting. OK. Anyway, so agriculture. 10,000 years ago, we invented something really astonishing called agriculture. And we began changing our habitats and culture at a furious pace. 
Um, we started living in dense communities. We started eating a limited amount, a limited variety of foods. We began mining minerals from the earth. And um, we invented the assembly line. So in the process, uh, the fast pace of life, oh, the fast pace of life continues even today. We're still in the midst of a lot of dangerous technologies, such as cell phones, electricity, and chairs. I think it's kind of ironic that the evolution has to keep up with the fast pace of life. Um, so I said chairs. I want to tell you that chair technology is deadly. So if you ever stood on a rolling chair to reach something high, perhaps near a plate glass window? I certainly have. Well, next time remember Stefan Mako, who uh, was filling his bird feeder on the balcony, standing on a chair. He rolled off the edge and fell 23 stories to his death. <laughs> Even the common bar stool is deadly. Um, in, Trenton, in Trenton, New Jersey last year, a man motorized his bar stool and began driving it to and from his local pub. <laughs> well, one night he rounded a corner too sharply and he took a turn for the worse. Now, this, Darwin, th this, this man is still among us as a near miss, a sort of a cautionary tale, and we hope he can learn a lesson from his own mistakes. But our philosophy at the Darwin Awards is to learn from the mistakes of others. You simply don't have time to make them all yourself. Okay, next slide, please. So, electricity. Whether you're electrifying your car to prevent theft or you're poking a pair of shoes off an electric line using a copper pole, electricity is the perennial fast track to a Darwin Award. And I'll be talking more about electricity and mutations in a moment. Cell phones. I call this well-known deadly, deadly, deadly uh, distraction the pocket menace. And the pinnacle of cell phone abuse occurred in 2002 when a man was struck and killed by a locomotive while he was calling for a tow truck. You see, he was walking down the tracks paralleling the road. A reliable witness stated that he's holding a cell phone to one ear, walking down the tracks while he blocks out the noise of the oncoming <laughs> locomotive. Momentum always wins, and cell phones always lose. <laughs> So lose a cell phone, save a life. So, now the Darwin Awards supposedly chronicle extreme examples of natural selection. I'm often asked and I often have wondered myself, are they really showing human evolution or are they just silly stories? For 15 years I considered them a parody and when people asked me this question, no camera please, Yet when people asked me this question, I hedged, I hemmed and hawed a bit, because I truly believed that, at best, they were abstractly illustrating the principles behind natural selection. Um, after all, no one's identified a gene for smoking in an oxygen tent, or a gene for jumping out of an airplane with a backpack instead of a parachute. In the past, I suspected humans were not evolving. And the way the common thinking goes is that once we invented eyeglasses, there was no need for, common, for, for good vision, and our eyesight's been really going downhill ever since. For every medical advance, there's a devil's advocate that says it's setting back natural selection. Well, I really don't know how eyeglasses are affecting the human race, but I can tell you that the notion that we're somehow slowing down or stopping natural selection is flat out wrong. So I want to start with the basics. As all of you here today know, evolution is true. It is a proven fact to the full extent of our reasoning capacity. It happened in the past, it's happening now, and it will happen in the future. Evolution happens to inorganic and organic systems. And natural selection can even involve computer algorithms that are more complex than we can program ourselves. Um, evolution, the tool of evolution is one of the most important insights we have ever had. So the evolution of humans proceeded at a slow and steady pace. For six million years, we could sit back and enjoy the scenery. But all of that changed the day we started planting crops. We built fences. We kept ourselves and our children safe from harm. With no reproductive limits, evolution suddenly started speeding up 100 times faster than it ever was before. We began treating evolution like an extreme sport. And this is called adaptive radiation. But I wanted to ask myself, in what direction are we radiating? When I analyzed some of the trends in the Darwin Awards, um, this is a graph of the number of chapters in my six books that refer to various topics. 
Of course, a lot of the Darwin Awards are miscellaneous, but I saw two very interesting themes. I could divide them into modern dangers that we have created for ourselves, and what I consider possibly prehistoric dangers, dangers that are more, they're contributing circumstances to Darwin Awards more often than they are actually the cause of a Darwin Award. So in modern dangers, it shocked me to realize that the number one modern danger is technology. The technology involved in working a nine to five job, the dangers of the daily job, I have a chapter in every single book about that. Weapons are also dangerous, whether it's the military or police officers or criminals. Um, vehicles, we all use vehicles, extremely common cause of a Darwin Award winner. I also have uh, explosions, which are a well-known risk, but they're killing us at a rapid clip. All of my books have a chapter on explosions. And electricity. Electricity is another common danger that's a prominent feature of the Darwin Awards. There was another very interesting category that stood out. It was sexual miscongress. And while that's a talk unto itself, and I won't go into that today, um, it appears to me that humans have sublimated our sexual drive in order to build our great cities. And in the process, we've invented some very peculiar workarounds. <laughs> and women. I've had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to represent any women among the Darwin Awards. We don't seem to be risk takers. But <laughs> due to peer pressure, scrape the barrel I did, and I have some interesting things to say about women. And, and then other prehistoric dangers, I'm not sure if I mentioned, they're animals, very common cause of death, uh, falling, water, machismo, and criminal behavior, which I am hypothesizing could well be, a, have been something that's been with us since the beginning. So we do see that in other animals too. Today I'm gonna to be talking more about electricity in order to illustrate physical evolution, and women to illustrate mimetic evolution. So before I describe with stories these humorous targets of evolution, uh, the molecular clock needs a minute of our time. So in my book, Countdown to Extinction, Dr. Jane Palmer explains this nifty tool we've come up with called the molecular clock. Um, it precisely dates when a mutation happened so that we can accurately determine when we diverged from our ancestors all the way back into the depths of time. It provides yet more evidence of how interrelated all life is on this planet. Now, Dr. Palmer is a noted science writer with a degree in computational molecular biology, so I'm going to refer you to her essay for the technical details. But let me just say it's lucky for us that every sperm is sacred. <laughs> um, because as Dr. Jane Palmer uh, explains, the recombination events that lead to unique eggs and sperm also provide us with a molecular clock, ironically enough. And this molecular clock tells us that humans are racing forward at a staggering speed, two orders of magnitude faster, ever since we planted rice and cooped up chickens. Uh, so in the process of domesticating ourselves, we invented electricity, or at least we harnessed electricity. So from the famous French rock and roll singer who ended his life in a bathtub holding a light bulb. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's so funny. <laughs> to the infamous boy, frat boys who swing from Las Vegas light poles, uh, let alone considering the thieves who steal electrified copper wires to make a buck. Um, electricity is voting us off the island at a very rapid clip, despite warning labels on every electric cord. I have a hypothesis that humans are mutating to sense electricity and withstand electric shock. Now, this hypothesis has a lot of uh, scientific um, evidence to support it. We have hairs on our skin that can sense static electricity, and many of us can feel a hum when we get close to an electrical circuit. And I suggest that you try this yourself and see if you can feel electricity. <laughs> That's right, you know, make sure to write to me after you try it. <laughs> There are, uh, elect, uh, being able to sense and deal with electricity is very common to animals on the planet. Sharks, among other sea creatures, can emit and sense electrical signals. Uh, they use electricity like eyeballs. We also have a magnetic, uh, an electrical field around the Earth that many animals use as a compass to navigate their way north and south. Some humans have this inner compass and they never lose their way. Those who don't, well, one thing leads to another, and, and there you are lost at the end of a seasonal trail marked no trespassing, freezing to death, 
clutching a Darwin Award in your cold, dying hand. So also, not only can we sense electricity, but some of us are extremely resistant to it. We no longer use the death penalty of elect electrocution, in part because it is completely unreliable. Some people cannot be electrocuted. <laughs> so my hypothesis is that human mutants among us now possess electrical sensors and do not conduct well. So the Darwin Awards discontinued bin is completely full of electrical nitwits. And I say to you, seriously, we have the sensors. We have the negative selection pressures. And electrical mutants, I believe, are more than a figment of our imagination. They're a reality. Now, I'll talk about women for a bit. The more that I look, the more that I see <laughs> that marketing is driving natural selection today. I have some preliminary researches on the causes of Darwinian deaths in women. Since the advent of fashion, women have been tottering around on clumsy excuses for feet. From 16th century Italian Chopins to Lady Gaga's gorgeous, gorgeous gams, these boots aren't meant for walking. And they're killing us. From around the world, reports flood in. Women have fallen in front of railroad, in front of, in front of trains. They've fallen in front of buses. They're breaking their legs, falling off the curb. And most people I know know someone who suffered a severe injury from high heels. Now, um, I love the tall graceful of high heels, and I love how they feel. And I'm not trying to belittle or discount anyone in this audience. But this is a very important talk, and I'm wearing ordinary uh, flat shoes. I do have high heels. Um, I do have high heels, and I'm not against them. But I believe that their place is in the bedroom, not on the streets. <laughs> Our natural inclination to attract a mate has just been dri driven to a ridiculous peacock extremes. Nature already took care of this imaginary problem of how to look sexy, ladies. You are sexy, just the way you are. <laughs> this makes me angry, so I'll say one more word about it. Hobbling ourselves is not sexy. It's a sign of weakness, and it's Darwin Award dumb. OK, marketing is the new sexual selection. And consider do deodorant. Consider antiperspirant. Okay, People use antiperspirant at puberty to try to stop the smell of hormones. And as most of us in the audience know, there is not an antiperspirant that's been made that can prevent a teenager from smelling. <laughs> it's just not possible. Well, tell that to Jeremy, who used so much deodorant in an attempt to kill his odor that he killed himself with the toxic chemicals it contained. So we invent a problem, the problem of puberty. We pay money to put chemicals in our body to solve this imaginary problem, and it kills us or it poisons our neurological systems. <sighs> so mimetic evolution, those who really can't see the irony of marketing as the, natural, the new natural selection are really doomed to suffer. It's, it's invisible. It's so common. So all of these, by the way, all of these Darwin Award I mentioned are true stories. To sum up, I wanted to tell you that the thousands of examples that are mentioned in the Darwin Awards are not, in and of themselves, enough to have any influence one way or another on the human race. But they're the mere tip of the iceberg, you see. Evolution is all around us. Evolution is in our cell phones. It's in our electric wires. It's in our offices, and it is in our closets. Like Darwin's finches adopted to the Galapagos Islands, we are evolving to fit this funny new world that we've created. So I want to thank Charles Darwin, who I truly do honor with the Darwin Awards. And I would say to you all, beware the pocket menace. Be on the alert for electrical mutations. Get off your high heels. And remember, it's not the fall that kills you. It's sudden deceleration syndrome. Thank you. Thank you.